thought about raw sandwich <laughs> always comes to mind. And it's been, I had to pull it out of a scrapbook that I have of high school. And, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a special picture to me. And now, as a principal I, of myself, um, and, and just to make a correction, I think in some of your books it says that I'm the principal of a high school. And that's incorrect. I am a principal of preschool through eighth grade. So I am privileged to be in front of you today. Um, but as I look at being a principal and the relationships that I have with students and the impact that I can make on students on a day-to-day -day basis, um, this, this picture still resonates with me. And the impact that Ross made on my life um, is tremendous. But I'm going to back up even further than that. Because I know that I'm supposed to focus on the importance of documentation and what we should be doing on the day-to-day -day, um, as far as preventing the mental impact to us scenario. Uh, I'm going to get to that. But first I'm going to back up and say that about 35 years ago, these two people made uh, a huge decision. First of all, these, these are my parents. Bobby and Sue and me. They're wonderful, wonderful people. But the that'll never happen to us speech rang in their heads for a long time. My mom had six miscarriages before she had me. The, that'll never happen to us, that we'll never get to have children. When I was born, it was a huge deal. We were Presbyterian when I was born. <laughs> I was Presbyterian until I we were in fourth grade. I was in fourth grade. My parents at the time had me in a Presbyterian kindergarten, and across the street was a Lutheran school. My father was a Detroit police officer. We had to live in the city of Detroit, so our only option was you go to Detroit public schools or you go to a private school. Well, here again, another time when, in my parents' minds, that will never happen to us. We'll never, on a police officer's salary in the city of Detroit, be able to send our children to private school. I have two younger sisters. So about 35 years ago, they made this decision to sacrifice, to see what a difference a Lutheran school would make in the life of a child. That child. Me. And they made that decision to send me to that Lutheran school across the street, not knowing what an impact it was going to make all these years later. In the lives of all of the students that I got to teach, in the lives of friends that I know, in the lives of all of you who are sitting here listening to me today, which is kind of crazy. But it's true, I was born and raised in the Mead, which in the north, that means Detroit, not the town. So, um, and, and Detroit is a very special place for me. We've uh, built my ministry there. We've been there all throughout my ministry in, in Detroit. Um, my family is a law enforcement family. Like I said, my dad was a Detroit police officer. My grandfather was the chief of police in West Bloomfield, Michigan. My uncle was the bodyguard to the mayor of San Diego. He was a hostage negotiator. I've got law enforcement in my blood. And that's probably what I would have done. And maybe it's a little bit of what I still do today, right? Um, so I probably would have done that, except that there were times where I would say I'll never do that. My dad would come home from work and I'd say, I'll never do that. I'll never do the things that he had to go through. I'll never do that. So those words kept, you know, being uttered by me. I grew up in a neighborhood that saw no race. This was, the city of Detroit was very different then, yet still very much the same, but I grew up on a street and there was like a mini United Nations. We had kids of all backgrounds and cultures, and I saw no race at all. And I thought that's what the world was like, because that's what it was like in my family, and it was what it was like on my street. And so I went into school thinking that everybody was just like me. And that will never happen to me. So, also with my family, no one had ever graduated from college. No one had ever been to college. So again, another, that'll never happen to me moment. And those words kept coming up and coming up, except for this was in my eighth grade yearbook. This was me in eighth grade, lost with the eighties hair, right? <laughs> and if you can read the very bottom line there, my life ambition was to work with kids. That's all I knew. I couldn't pinpoint it, and I didn't really know exactly where that was going to end up. And I think even today, I'm still kind of in that, like, I'm not even really sure if what 
time for me today is really where I'm meant to end up, but I know I want to work with kids. And I know I want to make an impact in the life of a child. So, <laughs> I want to work with kids. I finished up high school, and I said, wow, well, I just go to college now. And I ended up at Deporting, Wisconsin. Yeah. Well, that's right. And again, I still thought that will never happen to me. I'll never get to be, I'll, I'll never finish this. No one in my family's ever done that. Except that, not that day, my two was not Still not working. Yeah, huh? It was working. That's what happened. before we had, you know, digital, and it was just like a roll the dice and see what picture you can get. And my husband, who's here with me today, took this picture from way up in the sand in the field house, and this was where my journey began. With a diploma in hand, and feeling like, man, I was going to conquer the world. Because I had a teaching certificate. <laughs> and I knew exactly what it was going to be like. It was going to be just like my neighborhood where I grew up was going to be just like the classrooms that we had in Concordia, and I was ready. And then I had that dangerous thinking still where I kept thinking that I'll never have to be. I'll never do that. You have those moments maybe before you had children. I'll never forget sitting in church one day at one of our congregations before Dan and I had children. And I saw a kid who was like basically climbing the walls and screaming and yelling. I remember telling them, our kids will never do that. <laughs> you know? And then we had our first child, a daughter, Emily, and she, she did. And I said, see? This is what happens when you're a good parent. And I, I took credit for all of it. Well, let you know what happens when you take credit for things. God says, here, have this one. <laughs> and so I had a second child, Jake, and he is a very special child. But he keeps us on our toes for sure. And he definitely makes it so that I can't take well. I guess maybe I should have took credit because he's a handful. But we have those moments in our life where we take credit and we say, that will never happen to me because of what I can do. Because what I'm going to do is going to prevent this from happening. I'm in control of this situation, so therefore this will never happen to me. And that's where it got dangerous for me. So here's how it began. This is getting into now the story of the Supreme Court. But first I'll back up and say, in 2003, we had a principal who decided he didn't want to be a principal at all anymore. He was just done. He didn't want to be the principal. And I was just a sixth grade teacher at the time. I had just had my son, Jake. And like all good principals do, the Board of Ed, you know, volunteer said, sure, I'll go classroom to classroom and ask the teachers, do you want to be the principal? And so they came down the hall and they said to me, you know, how about you? Would you like to be the principal? And pardon me, but I said, hell no. Because <laughs> there's no way I want to be the principal. My first few years of being a, being a teacher, I watched what the principal had to do, and there was no way in God's green earth that I ever wanted to be a principal because I saw what principals had to go through. His schedule alone made my head spin let alone the situations that I was able to walk away from at the end of the day and go, hey, good luck with that. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, and I don't know when left. And he didn't. So that day, that's, that was my reaction. I, I, I had to just be totally honest about that. But as they made their way down the hall, the rest of the teachers said, well, we really don't want to be the principal, but we think you should consider Stacy. My first moment of being thrown under the bus by my colleagues. Um, and then to add an insult to injury, Bruce Brown, who's our ed executive in Michigan District, good guy, also was a teacher at, at Westland when we were there. 
Um, I had just served on an accreditation team with him, and he said, he wrote a letter and said, I really think you should consider asking Stacy to be the principal. Um, you know, there are very few people in life that I can't say no to, Ross being one of them right here. Bruce is another one. I just couldn't say no. I had just had Jake, and I was working part-time, and I kind of did the, sure, I'll do it, but I'm only going to do it if I can have Tuesday and Thursday afternoons off, thinking they'll go, I don't know, we'll find someone else. And they went, okay. And I said, really? Okay. So I worked from home two afternoons a week, and, and I said, I'm only going to do it on, a, on an interim basis, because, you know, remember my response, I'm not doing this. Well, by January, they say, we really think that you should stay on, and I said, well, you know, I'm not going to do this by default. If you want me to be the principal, you need to get a call committee together, you need to get candidates, you need to interview, and if you still think that I, I'm, I'm trying everything I can, if you still think that I would be the best person for this job, then you can call me. Well, you all know that the result of that, I got that call and I accepted that call. And in my mind, I was I was so happy. I was like that girl holding that diploma, right? I was like, this guy before me, he didn't know, he didn't know he was doing. I know. I know what oh, and to top it off, well Dan Taylor was my home congregation. It's where I went to school. I was the daughter of the congregation. And so who better to know what the pulse of the community there is than a daughter of the congregation, right? This guy didn't know what he was doing. I'm going to change things. I'm going to turn things around. Things will be different. That won't happen to me. It kept coming out of my foolish mouth. Well, then in 2004, so this would have been my second year. I'm not even 30 yet. And, I'm oh, sorry, I... We have our end of the year golf outing. I'd like to take the faculty on the very last day, June 15th. We all head out to the golf course. I, you know, even if it's the one time you golf every year, I'm going to make you go out and golf. Well, Cheryl Parrish, one of the, the woman involved in the Supreme Court case, is one of those teachers. Like, she, she's, she's going out kind of beyond her will. She doesn't want to do it. So at the end of the golf outing, she says, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. One of the other teachers says, okay, I'll take you to the hospital. And we're all going, well, okay, whatever, she's getting that well, you know? So she goes to the hospital, and then she calls me back, and she says, I'm passing out. I don't know what's wrong. You know, it's a good thing it's summertime. So all summer long, I'm getting correspondence from her, and she's saying she's passing out like a dozen times a day, and the doctors have no idea why. They don't know what's wrong with her. She doesn't know exactly why this is happening. She doesn't have the diagnosis. The ball is quickly upon us, and at the encouragement of the board, I say to her, maybe it would be a good time for you to take, you know, to apply for medical disability. Let's get, you know, let's follow Concordia. Let's see if we can get you on disability. That way, you know, you can get better and then come back. And I'm thinking maybe a few weeks, and then she'll be back. So we make the decision to combine. She was teaching um, third grade at the time. So we made the decision to put her third graders in with the second grade class. And the second grade teacher, you know, she just says, fine, whatever, it's just going to be a few weeks, right? Well, then Christmas starts to roll around, and we still don't have a diagnosis. And we've gone through, like, five diagnoses, actually, by then. And all of them are, you know, replacing the last one with, oh, no, they were wrong, and now, now they think it's this, and now I'm getting testing for this. And so February through, well, let me back up, Christmas time happens, and I say to her, you know, Cheryl, we're in a tough spot. I got I have parents who are really upset. This is only supposed to be a short-term solution. We really need to separate this classroom now. And so she was aware of it. We contracted a woman for that classroom to the end of the year. Um, during this time, we had been paying her the balance of her salary. So she was getting her disability benefits through the Corey plans, and then we were paying the balance. So she was getting 100% of her salary and all her medical benefits. At Christmas time, like a good Lutheran church does, we took up you know, our offering at probably like our Christmas program, and I took her cash, you know, paper products, and you know, all these things. I personally drove them to her home with hugs and love and get better and we love you. And then um, the new teacher
teacher started and she said, if she has any questions, have her talk to me. But have her email me, don't have her call me because I might be passed out and then I wouldn't hear the phone. So if she emails me, I'll be able to get back to her when I'm not passed out. So that's kind of how we rolled for a month and a half or so. And then one morning I'm home with a sick child and I get a call. Stacy, get up here. Cheryl's here in the building. She hadn't been in the building not one time since June 15th when we left that ball county. Not once had she been in the building. So I throw on ball cap and sweatpants and run up and I she sit, she's sitting in my office with her arms crossed, and she's saying, I'm going to go back in the classroom right now, or I'm not leaving. You've got to give me documentation that I've got to be off the premises. I have no idea what to do. I am panicked. I call the RN exec Bruce Brown. I say, Bruce, what do I do? He says, write you know, a two-line thing that says, you know, if you didn't give us proper notification for return to work, you have to leave the premises. So I type it up real quick. You know, she's sitting next to me while I'm typing it up. My fingers are shaking. I don't know what to do. And so I hand her the paper, and I'm still thinking, you know, we, we love you. You love us. We're like a family, right? And later that day, I call her, and I say, what just happened? I'm, I'm so confused. I was at home now. Remember, I had a sick child at home, so I'm back home. And I can picture myself standing in my son's bedroom on my phone with her and me asking, what just happened? Where are we at here? And she said, I want to come back to work. I want to come back to work, and I want to be in the classroom. And if you won't let me be in the classroom, then I'm going to sue you. Wait. And, and, like, it was surreal. And I said, I, I guess I don't understand what you're saying. I, you know, you haven't been in the building. Um, I think that most of the teachers know that when they haven't been in the building, you know, most of us spend the whole summer in the building getting our classrooms ready. And, you know, you don't just walk into the classroom and start teaching one day, and especially when you've been gone all that time. And I also felt like, looking at what's in the best interest of children, was it really the best interest of those kids for them to have had three teachers by the month of February in one year? Third graders. Not only that, but these were kids who now, we're being told she's passing out a dozen or more times a day. Are these third graders going to be okay with handling that? Well, obviously we know that where that you know, determination landed at us because we're not allowed to ask questions like that. And so in that moment of, I, I have no idea what to do, I asked her, are you sure that's what you want me to say? We're going to have a board meeting tonight. What do you want me to tell the board on your behalf? She says, I want you to tell them that I'm going to be back in the classroom or I'm swinging. I said, are you sure? Are you sure? I, it still was not registering with me. And that night I went to the board meeting and I told them, this is how the conversation went. And I still, after those words came out of my mouth, I still said, she won't do it. She won't go through with this. She loves us. Look at all we've done for her. We are a family. How could, she would never do that. We've been working together for four or five years now. She would never do that. I assure the board, you know, this is just a scare tactic. Let's not worry about it. You know, let's just let it go. Well, a week later, we got a letter from her attorney. And even then, we kind of took it, you know, it was kind of, we were kind of nonchalant about it. Because, you know, you've probably all gotten letters from attorneys, right, where it's just, you know, they're, they want to scare you a little bit into action, and then you take care of it, it never goes anywhere. So I get this letter from the attorney, from the attorney's letterhead, and um, this is where, enter Dino Ware. This is just a dad from my school, right? He's just a dad, he comes in one day, and I'm, I'm like, Dino, I, you know what, I need your help, dude. I, I don't even know what I'm doing. I got this letter from the attorney, you know, 
I, I can't even like explain the whole situation to him. He's like, you know, I do like divorce and bankruptcy, and, uh, you know, like I, I've got a tiny little practice right outside of Detroit. I don't know anything about employment law. I really don't know how I can help you, but let's send a, a counter scare tactic letter. You know, like let's just send a letter back on my letterhead saying, you know, hey mom. Well, it was really game on. <laughs> and little did we know, you know, what game on was really going to mean. And for me, this was great. Our very first really big meeting happened on my birthday, February 13, 2005. And he was there, and she was there, and the board was there. We kind of all talked through it. And just before this, we had found out that our pastor was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. He collapsed in the pulpit one day. And so now it's just me. I single-handedly, 29-year-old, running a church and a school, trying to come alive to me. I'm scared, and I'm still uttering those words that'll never happen to us. I'm still convinced that this is just not gonna happen. And I, I've got Dino on my side. I mean, look at him. He, you know, he's a pretty, he's, I mean, he's a pretty no nonsense kind of guy. So I figured, you know, if we're doing the right thing here, we sit down with her. I figured this is where it's all going to end on my birthday that year. Well, it didn't. Obviously, it didn't. That's when she said it's true. I, you know, contacted this attorney, and we're not stopping here. We're, we're, we're not going to stop here. So that's when I wrote to the we got, I received a subpoena from the EEOC that spring, and again, like many of you, you've probably been subpoenaed before. Maybe this is more of an elementary school principal phenomenon, but I get subpoenaed all the time. When someone comes in to give me a certified letter, I automatically assume it's a subpoena. My school, my secretaries are like, hey, you got subpoenaed again today. But, you know, usually it's like a custody case. It's an attorney who is just saying, you know, that I've got to be on call because they're going to do this trial and they're, they're trying to determine custody. And they want me to testify on behalf of one of the parents. That's usually what it is. So, you know, I'm not really that concerned about it until I open it up and realize this is a federal subpoena. It's a federal subpoena. And I've got to produce all of this information. And this is where I begin to be a paralegal. Because Dino's calling me. I need this, I need this, I need this, you know, put it all together. I'm putting it in binders. I, you know, who was like taking care of kids during that time, right? I mean, my focus was 100% on this, and that's where the really unfortunate thing, I think, in all of this was, was that my focus was really in the wrong place. And I started out a ministry managing. I was managing day by day. And I was managing ridiculous issues that had to do with court. And it wasn't anything about what it's like to be a principal. Not at all. So, my good friend, Rich Schumacher, here today, um, was also a principal at my circuit at that time. And they had just had in the years previous, he had a student who died during the school year, and he had, he had, had, they had, had a teacher who died. So I think, now my focus is, okay, I've got all this paperwork done for the, for the subpoena, now I'm gonna put my focus back on this pastor who's gonna die. Well, I don't even know how to handle that. So I call Rich and his pastor, and they come over, and you know, we sit at a table, and we talk about media, and how to deal with that, how to deal with press release, and, how to get information out through care pages, and how to keep people posted on you know, our pastor's health. And in between, I'm going, he's in hospice at his home, and I'm taking shifts sitting by him as he's dying. And all of this time, I'm thinking, this is what being a principal is like. This is horrible. This is horrible. And I just kept thinking, is this, Lord, really? Is this really what you called me to do? I don't understand this at all. And Rich and her landmark came over that day, and, and we went through all of the, 
do this, do this, do this, and I took copious notes, and I, you know, made sure that I was doing everything that I had to do. And then we got up to walk out. And another moment that, you know, is kind of like imprinted in your mind, we start to walk out, and Rich grabs me on this shoulder, and I turn, yeah? He goes, both hands on both shoulders. Stacy, there's a reason why God put you in this position, at this time, in this place, because the person before you wasn't going to be able to handle it, the person after you wasn't going to be able to handle it, this is up to you to deal with. And you are not alone. God thinks very highly of you, and we are here to hold up your arms when you get tired. But girl, you've got to hold up those arms. And I remember bursting into tears and going, I, but I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> and, and Rich going, yeah, I get it. You know, like, I know you don't want to be that guy, but, but you are. And from that minute on, I kind of owned it. Like, uh, okay, Lord, you know, I've questioned it, I've wondered, what do you want from me? What is your specific calling for me? This was it. At that time, this was it. So, that first summer we go to mediation. And we're trying, we're trying really hard. Except that we're a congregation where on Monday I'm calling the bank, and Tuesday I'm calling the bank, and Wednesday I'm calling the bank to see which of our checks from the offering plate have cleared so that we can actually use that as cash. Because the electrical company is calling on Tuesday to say, if you don't pay a balance of $3,000 by Friday, your electricity your electricity's going to be shut off. So I'm dealing with this too. So when I go to mediation, this is the congregation I've got. This is the, the bargaining power I have in the, in the mediation. Is to go in and pretty much offer nothing. That's what I've been empowered to do. I have my board chair with me, and he and I go into this, this federal mediation. The mediator sits there, and we're both allowed to kind of plead our case. And then we have to go to separate rooms, and then the mediator kind of goes between each room. Okay? He comes to us. Here's what she wants. She wants forward and back pay in the, you know, to the tune of like $30,000. She wants her personnel file purged. Yeah, just think about that one. She wants pain and suffering. She wants her job back in the fall. And going along with that, she wants to be reinstated to roster, which I would never be able to her. I don't even have the power to do that. But talking to a mediator who's talking to us about the sign on, I know I'm not getting anywhere. Right. So when he and this is this is the these are the people that I'm working with now for the next like six years. Explaining how it's not signed on, it's in it. explaining what the call really is. I mean, people are so confused by all of it. So just the, okay, let's back up and talk part of it was exhausting all the time when you had to tell the story. Even to Dino, he was a dad at our school, he still didn't understand it. He didn't understand the call process. Your families, by and large, especially today, it's more than ever don't understand the call process. They don't understand it. Even the ones who claim to understand it, they understand the let's trust in God part of it. That's it. So educating our families on the call process, educating our, uh, our attorneys on the call process was a, a huge undertaking. So that mediation failed because I was not authorized to give her, it, was, it ended up being a total of around $100,000. I wasn't able to promise her a reinstatement to roster that would never happen. Um, I was not willing to say that her personnel file would be purged, and I could have guaranteed her a job in the fall because I don't even know, frankly, if we were going to be in school in the fall. And if I was going to have to institute a reduction in force policy that, that year, I mean, I would never have gotten rid of one of my top nine teachers in order to bring her back. So that failed miserably. And then the EEOC picked it up, and the, the allegation was that we had discriminated against her based on 
our retaliation against her threatening to sue us. Because when she came to us and said, I want to be back in the classroom or I'm going to sue you, we said, okay, that's great. And we took her call away. We as a congregation voted on it. And um, from that day on, she was not called by us. <coughs> oh, here's the best part. I left this part out. She was not a called teacher when she started as a teacher. She was a contracted teacher. And she went back to get her colloquy so that she could be called. That's going to be important later in the case. So it goes federal. And we have been now accused of discriminating against her based on the ADA because she finally has a diagnosis. She's narcoleptic. And the plan is this. You are going to have her in the classroom. And when she has an episode, you're going to provide a safe space for her to rest and rejuvenate. And then when she is able, she'll return to the classroom. She had two college-age sons. She was not able to drive at this time because, you know, when you have seizures or anything suspected of, of that, you can't drive. So she wasn't unable to drive. She had two college-age sons. And I was also supposed to provide room for them to work through the day because they were going to drive her to school, sit and work on college studies, and then they would take her home at the end of the day. And I'm going, I'm going, again, I'm not even 30, but this doesn't make sense to me. Really? Like, this, this is what we're going to do? And the, my attorney, you know, says, you know, Stacey, there, there's also a portion to this that, you know, we can fight too because, it, you know, it goes back to, like, the essential function, being able to perform the primary duties of your job. You can't be a quadriplegic and say, well, I want to be a firefighter. And if you don't let me, I'm going to sue you. If you can't perform the essential functions of that position, you can't sue based on that. So we really felt like, okay, that was the beginning of our case. If she can't perform the essential function of her position as a teacher, she can't, she really doesn't have a basis for a case. So we went into it with that mindset thinking, all right, we're, we're solid. Except that we weren't. Because that was a medical determination made on our behalf that we weren't allowed to make. So it doesn't, it doesn't end. And it, it just, we, we keep doing this over and over where I keep thinking in my, in my mind, it, you know, she'll never do that. She'll never keep this going. It's never going to keep going. Except that it did. And we went then after that to district court. Um, leading up to district court, we had depositions taken in the summer of 2008. I went down to the federal building in Detroit, and I was deposed. One of the days I was deposed, for eight and a half hours with not even a bathroom break. Eight and a half straight hours. And that was a day where her attorneys, I mean, it was Dino and I on one side of the table, and her and her attorneys on the other side of the table, and a court reporter sitting next to me. And the, you know, you're not allowed to sigh. You're not allowed to respond, you know, with your with your body language, with words at all. You just have to sit quietly and listen to what the other side is saying. Her attorneys are deposing me for eight and a half hours, asking me the same questions over and over. Oh, well, Mrs. Hecht, you know, three questions ago, you answered it this way. But now you're saying this. Does that mean that you were not correct in the first statement or you're changing your statement now? To the point where my, I, I didn't know what I was saying anymore. It was like, an interrogation like you see on, on TV where people end up admitting to crimes they didn't commit because they didn't they, they can't take it anymore. And I remember walking out of there and poor Dino, you know, he had like five tickets on his car because he had parked in a meter spot. And we thought, you know, we were gonna be in and out and because we weren't, he had just had a pile of tickets and, and it was a crummy day. I remember getting in the car to call Dan and say, you know, I'm on my way home. I thought I was going to be home by lunch. The kids are at a babysitter. I, you know, I called him to say, I'm on my way. He says, okay, what do you want to do for dinner? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. I can I one more question. And unfortunately for him, that's kind of how a lot of my 
ways went. Because that's how I felt every single day, pressed from every angle. So if my teachers came to me with a need, I kind of, I kind of responded like that to them. When families came to me in need, I responded like that to them. When my husband and my children came to me with a need, that's exactly how I responded because I was always on edge. I was always second guessing what I was doing. I was always, like I said, pressed from every angle. And it was, it was just more than any person should have to handle at any point in their career. I remember sitting with, I, I think I told this story last night, um, I remember sitting with the guys in my circuit, you know, you, you see, I don't really get the mold for the school principal. Lots of people, when I go to meet them in my office, they walk past me like this. Like, you can't possibly, you must be like the secretary to the principal because you can't possibly actually be the principal. And um, so I was saying this last night in, in our circuit, all men, all very good, solid principals, some who have been doing this for you know, 25 and 30 years, Rich was one of them, he, he had just a year on me in experience. And I would go to, we have monthly circuit meetings, and, and we go to these meetings and I would go, okay guys, here's the latest, what do I do? And they'd all go, I don't know. Um, and I remember Carl Schmidt, if anybody knows Carl Schmidt, great man. Um, a lot of experience, and I remember asking him very specifically, Carr, how do I deal with this? And he said, Stacy, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've never dealt with anything even close to this. I don't even know what to tell you. And half of me thought, oh, I, he doesn't know how, what, how am I going to know how to handle it? And the other side of me thought, well, if a guy doing this for 20 years doesn't know, then, you know, maybe I'm not so bad. That maybe it's not so bad that I don't know. So it really, I guess, helped, but didn't help. But these guys, every month, sat side by side with me and tried to help me walk through this. And when it went to district court, like I said, we did the, all the depths, and then we asked for a summary judgment. We asked them to just, for the judges to look at it and say, there's no case to throw it out or we need a hurt. They denied our request for summary judgment. And all along, we kept getting, we kept getting, you know, good news, oh, good news, good news. I get a call. Hey, guess what? Good news, it's over. Um, and then, and then, it, you know, it's like, oh, just kidding, you know, she appealed it. And you know, every time we celebrate, it was a big moment. In 2000, this is I'm going to back up from 2008. 2007, I was at the pinnacle of the stress in, in this scenario. Uh, like I said, my husband's here with me today, and, and he knows that I'm going to talk about this, but not only was I dealing with this in the professional arena, but at home, my husband, because of all that was happening to me, and I, I wasn't being the wife that I, I knew that I should be, and I, I was never home, I was short when I was home, he turned to drinking for that. And it turned into a huge issue for us, personally. He didn't know as a spouse, I know there are spouses in the room here today, he as a spouse didn't know how to help me. And I think too as a man who just wants to get in there and help and solve, you know, he wasn't able to get in there and solve this for me. And every day that I came home and cried, you know, you hold it together all day long and then you get home and you lose it. And I did that too many days in a row so that he started checking out. Yeah, you know what, I, I get it, same thing, I like that. Uh, I get it. You know, you're stressed out. That's great. I'm going out with the guys now. Every night of the week. Until we, we, couldn't, we couldn't function as a family anymore. So personally, I'm dealing with this at home. Professionally, I'm dealing with this at work. And, and I don't know the way out. And I don't know where it's going to end. I don't know how it's going to end up. And I'm feeling the weight of the world on my shoulders the further we go into this case, the, the more real it becomes to me that I could potentially be ruining the futures of all of your congregations, all of them, by a single decision that was made in a moment where I thought that would never happen. 
So we go, like I said, the, the request for summary judgment um, at first was granted by the district court. The district court in Michigan granted it. I get the call, hey, good news, 2008. Um, I'm, out, I'm now at a different congregation, my current congregation. It was dismissed, it's all over. Yay, we celebrate, we go out to dinner, it's all happy. By then, by the way, Dan, completely sober. It's a big moment for us. So we had lots of reasons to celebrate. It looks like our lives are back on track. 